Well, uh, we are relenting this year, and uh, by that what we mean is that we are uh, going through that ancient practice of uh, Lent that the church started back in the 4th century, and, and some of you may not have done this, and this is new for us. And I've heard from some of you that this has been difficult, that, you know, you started off on this, and then it's like, you know, okay, two weeks in, two days in, two hours in, uh, I just couldn't do it. And you go, I'm a failure, and, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody about my Lent because I'm just a, a, a bad person, you know, I failed. And I want to say to you again that if that's you, that if you started off and you said, you know, I'm going to give up something that I think I can do, and then you found out that you couldn't, that you really didn't fail. Because, you know, I'm not just spinning this, but but listen to me. When, when you try to do something for God and you find out that it's beyond what your present power is, then that's the teaching. That's what you got out of this, is that this is the point of my weakness. And God always works at the point of our greatest weakness. That, that's where he wants to get into our lives. So, so even if you didn't like, you know, nail this thing about giving something up, you, you still have learned something out, out of the Lent. And I don't want you to forget that. Some others have, have told me that, you know, Lent has been really good and I gave up this or gave up that and I'm not going back. You know, come, come Easter Sunday, I'm just carrying right on. That thing that I gave up, uh, I'm not going to go back and do that again because I've learned a new way. And uh, the, the whole purpose of this was to make some room in our lives for God. And some of us have learned that we've made this room, and, and this is good, and I'm glad I did it. Too bad I had to wait all these years to do that, uh, but I did, but this is the right time. And so, uh, you know, I just want to put that out there for some of you. I want to come clean this morning and uh, just admit to you that I really, really miss my remote control. Um, this has not been easy. Um, I'm that guy who can watch five shows at one time. I, I really can. Uh, and uh, I have no problem doing that. I'm the surfer dude. I'm the guy with the remote controls. I have a whole bunch of them together. I love my remote controls, and I can do all kinds of things. And when, when I was in junior high, I was taught how to speed read, and that's the way that I watch TV. Is that? And, and really, you can watch a lot of shows because most TV shows, uh, you can skip around and come back, and they're going to tell you the same thing over and over again. You know, so that's what I did, and I gave up my remote control for most of the time uh, for Lent, just simply because I began to see my future. Do, have any of you ever had that, that you know, that aha moment where you see who you're going to be if you don't stop doing something, like you're on this projectile and you're just a little bit off base for a while, but the longer you go on this projectile, the more off base you get. And I began to see myself in the future because I was just getting up in the morning and coming downstairs in my bathrobe and getting my cup of coffee and sitting in front of the TV and just going through news show after news show, five or six of them at a time, and just grumbling and grouchy and uh, you know, the government, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood and all this stuff, and, uh, Louisville, you know, just, just doing all that kind of junk. And then what I saw myself is I thought, you know, Don, if, if you don't, stop this projectile the way that you're going, it may be two, three, four years, but the time's going to come when you come down in your bathrobe and you sit in front of the TV and you never leave. <laughs> you're just going to become that old curmudgeon that just sits in front of the TV all day and just, you know, knows what's wrong with everything in the world and everybody. And uh, this Lent has been a good time for me, but I still miss my remote control because it's so exciting. I mean, just think, all these channels and all you have to do is just hit a button and there's, there might be something exciting. There never is. But there might be something exciting on that other channel. And I kind of miss that. I, I don't think I'm going back. Today our subject is hunger and thirst. We may not relate to real hunger or real thirst because we probably haven't really been hungry or thirsty. Um, but hunger and thirst are the two metaphors that God uses oftentimes in the Bible to... Um, explain that inner desire that every person has for God. Whether you're a God seeker or not, or you know it, every person has this inner desire for God. And we may think that what we really want is recognition, or what we want is happiness, or what we want is peace, but God tells us that no, no matter um, 
what we think we are seeking, what, what we're really seeking is to find our, our place with him. We're really seeking to find our home with him. And this wonderful story in the book of John, it's, it's called The Woman at the Well is what the heading will be on it. And I found, uh, it's found in the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. I'm going to be skipping a lot through this. It's kind of long, so I'm going to tell some of it and read some of it. It's on page uh, 811 in the Pew Bibles, Pew Bibles, Chair Bibles, Floor Bibles. It's on page 811 in the Floor Bibles. And this is kind of long. So uh, the, the story goes that Jesus was headed to Galilee from the south. And he's been down at Jerusalem. And most people that were good Jews would go around the Samaritans, and they're in the middle. And he needs to go up to Galilee that's in the north. But Jesus didn't do that. And there had been this long battle between the Samaritans and the Jews that really go back about 700 years. And the Samaritans were our Jews too, really. And the, the problem was they were living in the tribal area that was conquered by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians conquered these, these tribal areas of the Jews, the Assyrians, instead of carting them off into captivity, the Assyrians populated them with their own people. And so when they populated them with their own people, they intermarried with the Jews. And they be, took up their culture, they took up their practices, took up a lot of their religious practices. The southern Jews that lived down in Judea, they were really taken into captivity by Babylon a little bit later. When they came back from captivity, they, they had not intermarried. They thought they were pure. So they had this animosity towards the Samaritans. They called them half-breeds. And normally a Jew would not go through this, this area. They would avoid the Samaritans. They got the cooties. They would not go through there. Instead, they would go around. But Jesus goes through, and he, and he comes to this little village, and uh, he sits down outside of this really famous well that old Jacob had dug about a thousand years before. And Jesus is bushed. It's high noon. And, and the, the disciples go into the, the, the village to, to get some lunch for Jesus. And while he's there, this woman comes out to get some water, and Jesus begins his conversation with her. And he said, well, how about getting me a drink of water? You know, and she's shocked. She's surprised. First, she's surprised because he's a Jew and she's a Samaritan and they don't talk to each other. Jews are really uppity about this. And they wouldn't talk to the Samaritans. And secondly, she's surprised because if you're a man in public, you just don't go up and talk to another woman in public in their day. You know, it, it just totally scandalous. And so here's Jesus, a Jew, talking to a Samaritan woman. And she tells him that. She tells him, you know, you're a Samaritan or you're a Jew and a man. What are you doing talking to me, a Samaritan woman? And Jesus says to her, he says, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. And she says, right, yeah. You don't even have a bucket, dude. You're, you're out here and, you know, you don't even have anything to let down on the well. Where do you think you're going to get this living water? And I picked this up at, at verse 13. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to her, Sir, give me this water, so I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Now we're kind of snickering probably. We go, this lady's not too bright. You know, she th actually thinks that Jesus has some kind of miracle Evian water that he can give her, that she will never thirst again. Maybe that's why she doesn't even get named. You know, she's just the woman because she's not too smart. But she really isn't mentally challenged at all. She is just tired. And I think that's a real theme here. You see, she's tired of getting the water, uh, among other things. And what we really see is two tired people. We've got Jesus. He's physically tired. He's been walking all day. He needs something to eat. He's so tired, he doesn't go into the village. And then there's this woman, and she's tired. And she's tired in a different way. I, she's tired of who she is. I don't know if you've ever been there or not. 
I don't know if you've ever come to that place where you go, I'm just tired of who I am. I've, I'm tired of who I've become. But Jesus sees that in her, and he knows it. And she says, he, he says to her, he says, go get your husband and come back. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, I know. You've had five husbands. And the man that you're with right now, he's not your husband. See, now we're getting into this hunger and thirst on her and why she's tired. Six men, six men, five of them have been husbands. We go, wow, that's, that's a lot. In their day, it was easier to get a divorce than what it is in our day. Our day, at least you have to go see a judge and pay some money, give the lawyer something. In their day, all you had to do was just take a piece of paper and say, you're divorced. You're old and saggy and I don't like you anymore. Just go away if you were a man. You didn't have to have any grounds. Other than that, I'm tired of you. You burned the toast. That was all you had to do. That's happened to her five times in her life. Five times she's been put out by a man. And now this guy that she's living with, he goes, no reason for me to marry you. Don't need to. You know, I'll just tell you to get out of the house anytime I want. That's who she is. Now, in our day, I guess that's not that unusual. In their day, it was scandalous, absolutely scandalous. And, and what was more scandalous was the fact is that Jesus is talking to her. Because, you see, in their day, they thought, the religious leaders thought that if somebody had cooties, that you could get them from them, right? And if somebody had sinned, that it was guilt by association. So you didn't hang around sinners because it would rub off on you, and, and you'd become a sinner too. And that's the way they looked. And here's Jesus talking to her. But he didn't care, you see, because she's thirsty. She's tired. She's weary. He's got the water. She thinks she's got the water, but Jesus has got the water. So he's reaching her to her point of need. Listen, everybody, I think, is hungry and thirsty. I, I love the, wor the verse that I began worship with today from Psalm 63. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. That just caught me this week. A dry and weary land where there is no water. Well, we are living in a very dry and weary land. No, no matter what the economic indicators say, okay? We, this, this land is very dry and weary. The, the generation at hand is the most abused, neglected, aborted generation in history. Think about that for a while. Some of us that are older think we had it bad. We don't know what it's like to grow up in this generation today. Today it's normal to hurt. That's, that's what it's become in our culture in just a few short years. It's normal to be somebody that's really sad. Today it's, our, it's normal to feel rejected and alone. The land in which we live is very dry and very weary. And, and, you know, I hurt for people that have grown up like that. And that's the normal that they know is being hurt. And honestly, many of those that are really hurting and, uh, and thirsty aren't the people that we would guess. You see, we, we hear about people that all oh, they, you know, they're neglected, they're abused, they're, they're, they're dry, and we think, well, they don't have any money. They live in a bad neighborhood. You know, really, those who are the loneliest, the most rejected, are living in the vinyl jungles, like I live in, in suburbia. Places where we have, you know, a family of five, and everybody's in a different room all night. And, and, you know, the kids, kids are just feeling so, you know, left out, so uh, abused and neglected. And in those places, we hide our sufferings. Nobody talks about it. I received an email this week from a man I, I really don't know very well. Um, I've spent a couple hours with him totally in my life. Uh, I've done some business dealings with him. He's in another state. And... Uh, it, it struck me in this email, I'm just going to share part of it because I think if I share too much, it would really be giving away his confidentiality. But this is what he says. He says, Don, I'm struggling with some things in my life right now and I feel lost. I'm not spiritual or religious and I don't know a minister up here well enough to be comfortable. I hope you won't mind if I confide in you. Isn't that sad? I don't know anybody else to talk to. 
Now, he went on to share uh, some problems. I mean, he had lost his father recently, and he really misses his dad. His son was having some problems, and he was just kind of lost as to how to help his son. And then he told me about his own job problems. And then, then the last paragraph, he says, I hope my message isn't too much an imposition of your time. I know you have church members who rely on you. He doesn't really know, does he? But <laughs> then he goes on to say, but if you could say a brief prayer for my family and me, I would be grateful. Wow. I just, I just cried. I, mean, I, just, I just read that and I just started crying. Now, here, here's a man that's almost my age. If you could say a brief prayer for me. doesn't even ask for a big prayer. He just wants, to, you know, what he's saying is, he says, I think there might be a God. My life is just falling apart, but I think there might be a God out there, but I'm not sure. But I met this guy one time who, he's a minister, so he must think that there's a God. And I'll contact him and see if he can hook me up. See if he would just say a little prayer, not too much of an imposition in his life, just a little prayer, because that's all I'm worth, is just a little prayer. Wow. Can you hear that hunger? Can you hear that thirst? And like how many millions of people are there like that who just suffer silently by themselves? The thing that there, there is is there's a lot of imitations, and most of us go after the imitations uh, instead of the real food and drink. In fact, everything that we seek in this world is, is just an imitation if it's not God. Have you ever bought something that was a knockoff, a purse or a watch or, you know, a bag of some kind? And you bought it cheap and, and gosh, it's a third of the price of what the real thing is, but it looks just like it. And then the stitching starts to fall apart or the, or the you know, the stem of the watch just comes off in your hand. You go, oh my gosh. And, you know, the purse, the, the imprint on the side of it just starts rubbing off. And you go, well, that didn't last very long. Next time I'm going to get the real thing. Knockoffs always wear out. We deeply long to be loved, but we go after the imitation. Lust seems really like it might do the thing. We might make some love, right? We need to be respected. So fame lures us in, and we say, if everybody knows your name, then people will think you're somebody. We need to be valued. So the imitation of owning things and that are worldly, you know, that's a substitute. We need... External, uh, eternal life. So we think, if I can just get myself to live forever, if I can do something to this body, so I look young and I act young, I will live forever. All just cheap knockoffs, and they eventually break and they wear off. I think the greatest lie is, is if I just had enough money, then I could buy the things that I need to make everybody do what they're supposed to do, and, and, and the world would be good. Money can do a lot of good stuff, but the Beatles said money can't buy you love, and it can't. Money can't buy you love. I did find some things it could buy you. If you've got some excess money, okay, if you ever go to Universal Studios, tired of waiting in lines, $149, you can go right to the front of the lines. 149 bucks a day, you don't have to wait in line. You can just give them your money and go right to the front. Uh, if you ever happen to be in prison and a nonviolent offender, $90 a day will give you an upgrade so you can have a nicer cell. Wow, selling nicer cells in prison. Uh, if you've really got a lot of money and you don't care about this kind of thing, uh, now in South Africa for $250,000 you can shoot a black rhino. And oh, this is what's really ironic about this. The $250,000 they say they're using to increase this campaign to not shoot black rhinos. I don't know. That's some kind of, you know, when you put that formula in Excel, it gives you an error message, right? You know, this does not work. Uh, this is the one that I like the best. Uh, now it's becoming vogue that if you want your doctor's cell phone number and the, the right to get an appointment with him or her that day, the, that price is going from $1,500 to $25,000 a year. So you can buy a lot of stuff with your money. But you can't buy love, can you? Money can buy a lot of things, but it doesn't satisfy the hunger and the thirst. The hunger and the thirst of this land has grown worse as our income has increased. Everybody needs God. You don't have to hit the bottom in order to know that you need God. 
Everybody needs him. But first we try to satisfy uh, that hunger and thirst with knockoffs, with imitations like the woman at the well, when God has a different kind of water, a different kind of food. Now Jesus told the woman things about herself that he had no way of knowing, and she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And he told her about the day when uh, people would seek to worship the Father in the spirit of truth. I want to read that portion, uh, beginning with verse 24. Jesus says, God is spirit. It's necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. Now, now don't miss what, what Jesus is saying here. Uh, she's looking for the Messiah. She's looking for the Christ. And she has some idea of who he is and what he will do. And I can just kind of feel her excitement begin to build as she, it starts to sink in with her as he tells her things about herself that he has no way of knowing that she might be indeed standing in front of the one who is this long-awaited Messiah, this Christ. Jesus says to her, I am. That's the way that he reveals himself in the book of John. Is I am, I am God, is what he's saying. Remember, that's the personal name, the personal name that was given first to Abraham and then to Moses in the burning bush scenario when God is calling Moses to go back into Egypt and, the, and God is speaking to him out of the burning bush and Moses says, man, before I go, I've got to know your name. I'm not going to go down there without some kind of name. And God says, I am, or we transliterate that into Yahweh. That is the most personal, intimate name of God. And there's nothing that Jesus could say here that's more powerful to reveal who he is, in fact, than saying, I am. He once said, before Abraham was born, I am. When they came to arrest him that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I am. And they fell like dead men on the ground at that word. So he is revealing himself to us. And, and just at that opportune time, the disciples come back with their little lunch bags. And, and they see the woman, and they see Jesus talking to her. And I can just kind of read between the lines here, and they go, Oh, no, he's doing it again. He's talking to somebody he shouldn't be talking to. He's talking to that woman. And she kind of sees the break in things. And so she runs back into town to tell people, but the disciples don't say anything to Jesus, you know. And she, she leaves her water jug. She came out to get water. She leaves her water jug there. She goes back into town without it because she's found some better water, right? And then, and then we go on here, verse 31. It says, In the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Disciples ask each other, has someone brought him some food? And Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Jesus has got some other food. See, just, just a few minutes ago, remember, he's tired, he's hungry, uh, he's thirsty, please give me a drink of water. And, and, you know, he's trying to reach out to this woman and she's inwardly hungry, she's inwardly thirsty, and she left because Jesus gives her hope. He gives her kingdom food. And this is the thing. I, I want you to make sure that you, that you, that you hear here. Um, Jesus is fed. His other food is because he fed her. Right? He didn't get any real food. He doesn't care. Now, now he's fulfilled. He says, the reason my food is that I've done what I've come to do. See, I'm doing the will of God. By giving her the drink of this living water, he doesn't need anything else. And the rest of the story is equally as fantastic. The woman goes into the village. The people rush out to see Jesus. He stays there for two days teaching them. I could just kind of, you know, hear the disciples for two days. Oh, you know, don't touch that. Maybe we'll get out of this. I don't know. We're in a Samaritan village for two days. Hope this gets hushed. Hope nobody hears about this. But that's what they did. And then the end of the story says this. Um, John four forty one. 
It says, many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. Wow. Just in a two days' time, two days' time, these half-breeds, these Samaritans, this six-time loser woman, okay? She's the one that God uses to reach this whole village that this really is the Savior of the world. And we don't even know her name. I love that when Scripture does that. Don't, you know, we're not, we're not elevating her. We don't even know what her name is. She's the unnamed woman who dropped her water jug so thirsty that she believed that Jesus was the Messiah and then she rushed out to tell other people. Well, how hungry are you for God? How thirsty are you this morning? I want you to know today that God is hungry for you to have life. God is hungry for you to have rivers of living water coming out of you. I love that phrase. I love the, the metaphor of living water because it's so easy for us to become containers. You know, we, we think, oh, yeah, I went to church and, man, I, you know, I got this, oh, God spoke to me. I got this thing and we like snap it in our Rubbermaid container and go home and, you know, we get it open and by Tuesday we're just a little bit low. We get a little bit out and nibble on that a little bit and we want to, you know, save it for ourselves as much as we can. And, and God says, you're not containers, you're rivers of living water. Later on in the book of John, he says, says the same thing and he says, the rivers of living water, they're going to spring out of you. That's the Holy Spirit is what that is. And that's what he's telling us. We're not containers. We're supposed to be springs of this new kind of water that comes out of us. We were meant to be springs. In the same way that Jesus found his other food, and so we will find other food when we, we dare to be courageous enough to ask God to pour his spirit through us, not just into us, but through us, so that he might work in someone else's life that we know. We've been praying this Lent here at the gathering and also among the six churches that have been uh, joining together for this, that there would be a lasting breakthrough in the lives of each participant um, during this Lenten season. Uh, we've been praying that uh, you wouldn't be done, that this would be the beginning of something, that you would not only be renewed, but that spring of water would begin to flow out of you for someone else, and that you would hunger for God and his kingdom. Jesus, during the Beatitudes, had one about hunger and thirst. Matthew 5, 6, he said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled other translations say satisfied. I like satisfied better than Phil. This is going to satisfy your life. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, that means doing God's will. That, that that's, that's what it is. That's the good food. I, I want us to spend some time here. This will be the last real relent message. Next week we're going to talk about two kingdoms colliding. It's normal Palm Sunday. I want us to take some time at the end of this Lenten season, and I, I put two cards uh, in your, your uh, bulletin, and uh, one of them is for you to take home, and the other one is if you choose. I don't want to impose this on anybody. Some of you are just sitting here and going, yeah, I don't know how I wandered into this, but this will be over soon. Um, or maybe you just don't want to, just don't feel like you... Uh, like this hits you, that's, that's fine. You know, it doesn't hit all of us the same way. But, you know, sometimes it's, not sometimes, often it's good to put a stake in the ground at a certain place. I've got, my first Bible has a bunch of stuff like this stuck in it where I would write out a commitment at some kind of conference or retreat that I was at and, and put it in that Bible. And I get those out and look at them every once in a while. And those those things become uh, kind of stakes in the ground that we can hang on to. It's kind of like if you're climbing up a rock face 
And I don't know what those things are that they drive in the wall, in the rock. Does anybody know? Thank you. Whatever he said. <laughs> they drive those in the rock. And why do they drive them in the rock? It's because if they fall, they can only fall to there. They don't fall all the way down. And, and stuff like this is good for our lives because, you know, if, if you've been growing in the Lord in the last five or six weeks, then you know what you're more hungry for now than what you did when you started off. So, you know, on the back of the card, it's got I hunger for, and these are personal, all right? I want you to do two of them, those of you that, that want to do this. One of them we're going to tape up to that board. And, you know, we've gone, we've gone for five weeks, and I haven't told you what that was. You, you just kind of thought that was just some kind of weird thing that we got. On Ash Wednesday, when we gathered together at Crossroads Christian, we, we took some time, instead of imposing ashes on our foreheads, we went to these canvases, and there were six of them, and one went to each church. And those are things that people were giving up for Lent, along with things that they wanted to receive while they were giving up things for Lent. So that's what that is, okay? And I'd like for us to put our cards up there today. And uh, nobody's going to look at them, I promise you. Uh, it won't make it on Facebook, probably. Um, but if, if you would just write what you're hungry for on here, and then persons I know who are thirsty, okay? It's like we were saying, you know, you're going to get your other food when you do what God wants you to do. And when you're a spring of living water, when you're sharing your faith with someone else, then you're going to feel satisfied. You're going to feel feel your place. You're going to have, like Jesus, I'm not any hungry anymore. I wasn't physically hungry because he was getting uh, fed on the inside from God. So these are also the people that you might consider sending that that uh, that Easter invite. And I, I ask the, the, the band to come now, if you would. And uh, I just want to start, it off, start us off with just a few minutes of prayer. And let's just pray for the Holy Spirit to uh, uh, speak to you. And then while the band plays, as you're ready... I'll put the scotch tape over there, and you can come up as you will and tape yours um, with the relent side out, the, the writing side against the board, and uh, we, we will drive a stake in the ground in our lives, so to speak, so that we don't fall back. Let us, let us pray together.